Good morning to everyone. It's a little before 5 a.m. I'm in the middle of nowhere in Barber County, Alabama, and I'm getting ready to do the Elimville Breeding Bird Survey. The Breeding Bird Survey program is the most important source of information that we have on the status of breeding birds in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, I'm going to do the second of my third routes today, and I'm going to bring you along to uh, explain the importance of this program to bird conservation and to basically show anyone that's, that's getting into this uh, how I do my breeding bird survey routes and give some, some general advice. So come along and let's learn about breeding bird surveys. Now breeding bird surveys uh, start very early. They start about uh, 40 minutes before sunrise. So this, this route is going to start in about three minutes at 5.07 exactly, there's an exact start time and an exact start place for each route. And it seems crazy to be out here doing bird counts in the dark with just the first glimmer of, of uh, morning light coming over the horizon. But in the breeding season, birds are very active uh, before sunrise. Uh, there's a dawn chorus that goes on. There's also a chance to get night birds uh, I usually get, um, excuse me, Chuck Wills widows at this stop to begin my day. I don't hear any right now, but certainly uh, I can hear yellow breasted chat, indigo bunting, eastern kingbird, northern cardinal. Um, uh, I'll get uh, a dozen bird species uh, right here. So let me get started on my route and I'll explain things as I go along. Okay, it's more than an hour later. Uh, I'm now at stop 11 on this route. Um, sun has risen. Uh, we're past on course, but birds are still very active. So when I get to a point, this is point 11, I have a nice place to pull off here. Uh, a little uh, road that I've never seen a car come out of or go into. This is a very low usage road that my route runs along. I had one car go by this morning, but no other cars. Uh, and we're going to start this route. So I, I use my cell phone as my stopwatch. Start. It's exactly a three minute count. So now I'm counting. I'm just going to put my stopwatch down. And it, this is largely uh, birding by ear. So here's a mockingbird flying in. He's clearly going to go on the count. Uh, uh, one mockingbird, and there's another mockingbird. So it's not completely by sound, it's visual too. Had two mockingbirds. Here's a catalegret within view flying over. I just said it's a sound count, and now it's all visual. But um, in addition to the mockingbirds and seeing the catalegret, I hear an orchard oriole uh, back here. I hear a uh, uh, hear the mockingbirds. I hear uh, eastern kingbird. Uh, behind me so I'm gonna put these birds down on my sheet I'll show you the sort of sheet I use uh, in another program but I'm gonna put those birds down let's see what else we detect at this stop morning dove is singing over here fairly far away we grow speak singing off in this direction uh, Orchard Oriole just sang in the trees up here. We're going to add those birds to our tally. Now, we don't just record species, we record number of species. So, so far I have um, uh, actually three uh, mockingbirds. I can hear two doves, so I'm going to put two doves down. Um, one blue grosbeak, one Orchard Oriole. 
Orchard Oreo again. We would presume that's the same bird. Here's Eastern Kingbirds flying in, and I had heard those. So here's Eastern Kingbird right here. Um, there were actually two of those, so we're going to put two Eastern Kingbirds down. I'm going to just check my stopwatch. We're at two minutes and eight seconds, so we've got about 50 seconds left on this count. American Crow just caught over here, so we're going to add a crow. Blue Jay off in this direction, so we're going to put Blue Jay down. Mockingbirds are really loud. This is part of the deal. Uh, one noisy bird can make it hard to hear other birds. Blue Jay again. I hear Blue Gray Gnatcatcher. That's a very faint little call. He's over here in the trees. We're going to put uh, Blue Gray Gnatcatcher down. Got 10 seconds left on our count. And that's it, three minutes. It's very important to run these for exactly three minutes. Don't record the birds until you start the three minute period and don't record like if I happen to have a, a little blue heron fly over right now, it just happened at a previous point. It's not on the list, it's beyond three minutes. This is a standardized um, uh, survey. Standardization is very important. Exactly three minutes, same spot, same time every year, and that gives us the data that we need. Okay, let me move to the next spot. I want to show my means for recording the birds on a breeding bird survey route. For the first um, 15 years that I did these surveys, I uh, recorded birds kind of free flow into a box that I created for each stop along the route. And I would write down the birds in whatever way, whatever shorthand was easiest. Some of it was the alpha codes, the four letter codes that a lot of people use for birds. Part of it was, was almost the full bird name written out for birds I didn't encounter very often. And uh, some of it was like turkey vulture, was TV. I just knew what that meant. And then I had to transcribe all my notes from all, and I was doing four breeding bird surveys at the time for all four breeding bird surveys. And I just got behind. Uh, one year, there's a year that is uh, unrecorded bird numbers from all of the counts that I was covering because between work and family, I just got overwhelmed and I just never transcribed my notes. And then I lost them. It's, uh, it's really bad, I admit, it's really bad. Uh, and I'd spent all that time and effort and money to go out and, and record those birds, and then I, I never got the data into the data banks. So um, I finally waved the white flag and admitted that I'm a procrastinator, and I tried one year to just directly record my bird observations onto the computer-readable sheets, and, and that's what I've done ever since. It's, it's a little slower. I think I record fewer birds because I'm searching for the bird on the sheet instead of listening for birds. But since I've gone to this system, I've never failed to get all of the outcomes of my surveys in very promptly. I've never gotten them in later than mid-June now that I've gone to this technique. And so I, I guess the... Uh, the punchline of the story is that you need to find your own way to do this. If you're very organized, not a procrastinator, and have time to transcribe notes, I think the boxes with the free flow data is the best way to record birds. I used to use a tally sheet. Uh, I'd write down like INBU, indigo bunning, in my box. And I'd go on to other birds, and then I'd hear a second indigo bunning. I'd go back and put a second tally sheet. And then I'd be pretty sure I heard a third indigo bunny. I'd put a third tally uh, mark on that. Now with my new technique, I need to erase my one and replace it with a two. I need to erase the two and replace it with a three. It doesn't work quite as well, but the data gets submitted uh, right away. So uh, find your way to do this. And really, you know, 
the future is going to be you're going to open eBird, create an eBird list on your cell phone, submit it, and that will go to BBS also. That's not that's not a reality yet, but it's I think it's coming. Alternatively, Breeding Bird Survey has an online submission form, which I strongly recommend that you use. It saves a lot of work at the um, BBS office, but I'm not quite that far into it. I'm still using the old paper tally, not tally, paper uh, machine readable forms, which I'm showing here. Um, and, and that's how I do it. I'm sure that's how I always do it. But if you can use the online submission, do that. Okay, we're at, at stop 14. The, the morning's uh, moving along. It's been nice, not much traffic, nice weather. Um, now, the Breeding Bird Survey route is a, is a road survey. This was started in 1966 uh, by really a pioneering uh, avian conservation biologist, uh, Chan Robbins. And uh, he wanted to make these routes very standardized and to cover as much of the U.S. and, and Canada as he could. He was actually a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee. The Canadian Wildlife Service uh, got into this early on. So... This is really a U.S. and in, in, uh, Canada uh, effort. So these routes uh, st have a start point, and then every uh, half mile along this route, running 25 miles, there's a, a point set down. And, and ideally, the points are exactly at the half mile spot. But in, in a landscape like I'm working in, th there's not always a good place to stop at exactly a half mile. And oftentimes, you'll be within a view of a house. And so, uh, here we have a, a house behind me. But as I pulled in, I noticed that there was no car in the driveway. And I'm pretty sure that house is not occupied at the moment. Uh, pulling up in front of a, a house that's occupied is, um, is going to really disturb the residents. I, this looks really odd to anyone. Uh, a car stopping person or people getting out standing in one place with binoculars writing on a piece of paper doing stuff it just it does not look like normal behavior and it looks it looks bad to uh, residents now uh, this usually plays out with the people coming out sometimes angry sometimes curious and then you got to talk to them explain what you're doing hopefully they understand it's way better just to avoid all of that and you do that by not stopping directly in front of houses. And I make a real point of stopping before a house out of line of sight or just after a house out of line of sight, wherever that's possible. If houses are too dense, you can't do it. But uh, in, in the routes I run, I can almost always do that. Now, you might have to move a point a tenth of a mile forward or a tenth of a mile uh, in advance uh, to avoid the house and in my opinion that's totally worth it these uh, half mile distances are an ideal you want to average a half mile but if a few of these are 0.4 and a few few of these are 0.6 especially if you're consistent between years and make careful notes on your route sheet that that's what you're doing that's the way to do it uh, it's way better than stopping in front of a house making people nervous uh, uh, having to explain what you're doing, slow down your route, etc. So, uh, I could do that here, but if, if I can pan around and you can see, I'm counting in a world that really doesn't have many houses, and I don't need to stop right here. It's just a very nice wide pull off. Uh, it's this old uh, grocery store parking lot. That store has been abandoned since I started doing this count 20 years ago. Uh, it just sits here abandoned. Um, Anyway, that, that's one of my recommendations. Uh, don't stop in direct line of sight of houses. Okay, we've made it to, um, to stop 15. Um, I said uh, one of my main rules in picking my exact spots to stop and, uh, and do my BBS counts is uh, staying out of direct line of sight of, uh, of houses. Uh, another thing that I really try to do is get completely off the road, especially when I'm at a, um, uh, a, a paved road. So if you can see behind me, I'm on a very low usage road. I haven't seen a car on this road yet. 
and but I picked a spot where I could get completely off the road. Now I was a little lazy because there is so little traffic, but I I could have here pulled completely off the road and giving uh, at least two feet between the uh, the side of my car and the edge of the road. That's what I like to do on roads with any sort of traffic. And even though I'm right at a mailbox here, uh, potentially at a residence, I don't know if you can see behind me, but uh, this is uh, um, uh, we're in a rural area, and this residence is a farm, and the house is all the way over the hill uh, behind me. So I'm not attracting any attention at, at this spot. And it just and another point is, uh, Breeding Bird Survey routes. Uh, uh, document the change in birds for every reason that that birds may change or stasis in birds and so at this spot um, I didn't count this route last year because of the COVID-19 pandemic two years ago when I was here this was a wooded spot in the two years since I've been here last these uh, landowners have cleared this lot created a pasture where there was a woodland and it looks like up and over the hill they have a poultry barn so this landscape has changed. There's different birds here. Uh, and this is a dynamic landscape. This is changing. There's changes along this route every year. And, and this, is, this is a part of the world that is not subject to much human pressure. So anyway, that's really the point of these routes to, to see how a changing world is changing bird uh, populations. Okay, stop 29. Uh, let's get this one started. Now, one of the things that is important when you're running a breeding bird survey route is to develop a means to be efficient in transitioning from point to point. You're going to be doing 50 of these points in a morning, and any inefficiencies get multiplied by 50. So, I like to uh, have a, a clipboard. Uh, the current sheet only uh, on the on the uh, clipboard. I'll, I'll show you how this works. There's actually five sheets uh, with ten uh, points each on on a sheet. I put one sheet, I clip it at the top, set my uh, uh, timer on the clipboard, keep my pencil attached to the clipboard so I'm not looking for that. Set that all aside. I'm at very low usage roads here, driving no more than um, 15 miles an hour between sites. So I actually put my seatbelt, clip it behind me. Now that may not be safe in all circumstances, but that way you're not fooling with a seatbelt each time you get in and out. This allows me to do a count, end a count, get in the car, set the clipboard uh, on the dash, drive to a half mile, very short drive to the next point, stop, instantly get out, and be doing uh, a count. And with some efficiency, uh, you can you can be doing a count about every five minutes uh, two minute transition between sites three minute count two minute transition and that allows you to get more points in earlier in the day if you're very slow transitioning you can uh, make these counts last for hours and you can run them into the warmer parts of the day and that's really important here in Alabama so uh, uh, work on a means to be efficient in transitioning uh, between points. Okay, let's take a break from the field for a minute uh, to talk about uh, some of the stuff that you need if you're going to run a BBS route. First of all, if you're not already running a BBS route and you'd like to get involved, um, I'll post a link to the, the website, um, the uh, government website, uh, that explains BBS participation. But in a nutshell, uh, they will direct you towards regional coordinators, mostly state coordinators, and the state coordinators uh, parse out all the, the routes. And they're, they're just volunteers uh, trying to keep this big effort going. This is uh, mostly, I don't know the percentage, but it seems like about a 90% uh, volunteer effort in terms of getting the counts uh, covered. Uh, so when you uh, uh, are assigned a, a, a route and, and become a BBS participant, uh, you will be sent a packet every year. Uh, I think probably in March, most years they come, a, a good six weeks 
before the start of the route. And so here's what I got in the mail for the Elamville count. Uh, there's a, a map. I don't tend to use the map very much. The first year it's important to get you started. Um, but uh, the, the really, for me, the important part is the directions for the route, which is um, uh, once you, the start point, that's the most critical thing. Uh, I should actually put GPS coordinates or um, uh, yeah, GPS coordinates for the start route for any future people. Uh, because that's how you'll find it these days. You'll put that into your phone and navigate to your site. But then, as you can see, uh, there's then uh, directions for each site. And for instance, the first stop uh, at Elamville is only at uh, three tenths of a mile because uh, there's houses before and after, and that's a good stop point. And it's a description of where to stop over crest of the hill, Silvergate left. And so that's enough directions to, to put my car in the exact spot where that point occurs. Then at eight tenths of a mile, bottom of hill, 200 feet before a large oak on the left side of the road. Uh, that oak tree may be cut down some year, but uh, it's a 200 year old oak tree and it's probably gonna be there. So that's a good marker. It's a very large tree, very significant landmark, and then on and on. And uh, uh, I didn't create this route, but I've been doing it for a long time now and I have now created the most current list of uh, directions uh, for this route. And if you, you notice, I do this so I can just drive along, not look at maps or anything, stop at the stop sign and go straight. So there's no, there's no ambiguity about what to do. And eventually you remember your route. But uh, in the first few years, you, you know, there's lots of, my little routes run uh, uh, through a landscape where it'd be really easy to forget, do I turn right or left here? Well, I have indications, right at stop sign, left on 72, left at stop sign. So as I'm going through, uh, as I'm following my route, it's obvious to go right or left uh, or whatever. And you see, there's handwritten notes, uh, things change. Uh, the uh, uh, stopping point uh, that's good one year may not be good the next year. And so I'll write in handwritten notes when this sheet gets messy enough or when I get enough energy. I will uh, reprint it. And you notice this was revised in uh, 2010. So it's been a little while since I've done this. Now, in terms of the actual sheets that you're going to send in to the BBS route, you're going to send this back in every year. Uh, in case you don't end up running it the next year, we all have certain plans, but plans change. That's on file. The next person that runs it would get that. If it's not you, if it's you, it just comes back to you. Okay, there's a cover sheet. Pretty self-explanatory. Time, date, wind and weather condition, it's all explained on the back. It's real simple, uh, one to five scale. Now, the, the key uh, pieces of this, I think, are the data sheets. Uh, the machine-readable data sheets uh, are, are, are 10 sheets. So there's they're front and back. There's actually five sheets front and back. And this is what I'll put on my clipboard. I'll clip, when I start, uh, sheet one, uh, so I'm filled in the date yet. I need to do that. The, you you fill in data on the top of this sheet, but it's also on your your overall sheet. And then uh, if if you write your your numbers clearly on the sheet, uh, a machine will read it. And uh, and so there's some instructions online about how to do characters that machines have a, a, a less difficult time reading. But luckily, I grew up in the '60s. Learned to do my letters and numbers in the '60s. They don't seem to teach it correctly anymore, but I can create uh, numerals that a machine reads quite easily. And uh, and I carry a, a pencil with a good eraser, so I do complete erasure, no smudges, and I've never heard that machine has trouble reading my uh, data sheets. So that's it. And that's what you're going to complete and then send in, send all of this, mail it back in to the Fish and Wildlife Service, and they will... Uh, machines will, will read this and their crew will check it and then it'll go into the database. I just finished uh, stop 34. Still a nice day, not much traffic. This is a paved road so it's easy to drive but there's just no cars. Um, one of the interesting thing about the demographics of Alabama is South Alabama where I am right now is being depopulated. It's, it's, it has fewer people now than it did when I started this route 20 years ago and it's been declining since the late 20th century so 
um, if you want a part of the world without as many people, uh, here it is. Uh, now, one of the biggest challenges with conducting a, a survey, like a breeding bird survey, is to not let the common birds fall into the background. It, to, to keep paying attention, it's hard, it's 50 stops, and, and hear all of the birds. And I'll tell you, some birds tend to blend into the background and not register in your consciousness much more than others. So right now, sitting here, I hear a towhee doing a drink your tea. That catches my attention. That's, that's not a bad one. But I'll tell you, indigo bunnings for me tend to blend into the background. That chow chow, choo choo, chee chee sound, it, it's often faint. And it's such a common sound in this part of the world. You just quit hearing it. You got to really focus to hear it. Same with cardinal song. Cardinal song is northern card. The song of the northern cardinal is such a constant background noise uh, everywhere in this part of the world that your brain will will start to filter it out. We're we're sort of programmed to filter out common background noise so we can hear conversations and focus on things. So in a breeding bird survey, you're really working against that. I constantly sweep and think, what am I hearing? And often. I'll pick out Indigo Bunny that's been singing the whole time that was just simply not registering with me because it's it's background noise. So this is the challenge. You never get, you never detect all the birds. Uh, not all the birds make any sound and even among the birds making a sound, no human being detects them all because your brain just can't sort all the information. But by trying to stay alert and sweep, make your ears sweep the area for sounds you may have not written down you'll get better counts, you'll get more thorough uh, surveys. Okay, well that's gonna do it. Uh, another year, another uh, uh, successful Elamville BBS route. Uh, I just wanna close by emphasizing how important these uh, breeding bird survey routes are for uh, the conservation effort, bird conservation effort in the US and Canada. Uh, this is the primary uh, uh, database that decisions about bird management are, are based on. Uh, you may have heard the recent announcement that uh, 3 billion uh, individual birds have been lost uh, since the mid-60s. Uh, and the reason that uh, 3 billion loss was, was uh, uh, centered around a start point in the 60s is that's this program. That's that, those, the data used in that um, analysis were uh, breeding bird survey counts. So this is how we know whether uh, Kentucky warblers are increasing or decreasing or doing okay. Uh, this is how we know if um, any any breeding bird in, in the US or Canada is increasing uh, uh, or decreasing. It's, it's very important. Uh, so I would encourage anyone with uh, decent bird skills to participate, to pick up routes. There's lots of routes there's routes in every state every year that get, uh, that are not covered uh, because there's just not enough volunteers to cover all the routes. And with less data, uh, we have less information to act on in, in terms of uh, avian conservation. I will also mention that if you're a, a person with some bird skills and, and people know that you're the birder around in your neighborhood and, you know, I, I'm pretty much the the uh, state ornithologist in, in Alabama, since I hold a position at Auburn University, uh, and, and uh, people tend to funnel their questions about birds to, uh, to universities. And, and breeding bird survey experiences allow me to answer questions about birds much better. People will call me up and say, hey, Dr. Hill, uh, where's all the warblers? I haven't seen a warbler in years. Are they, have they gone extinct? And, and I'll say, no, warblers aren't extinct. Uh, a few populations are down, some are doing okay, but, but uh, no wood warbler is on the verge of extinction, you know? And, I, and I'll say, I just ran uh, 150 breeding bird survey routes, uh, stops, and, and looked at the birds and I said, the uh, Perula warblers and yellow-throated warblers and hooded warblers and Swainson's warblers are all still there. They're, they, they're still coming back and breeding. So it, it allows you some uh, a, a foundation uh, uh, of experiences, not just like I heard this or I heard that, 
I was out there and this is what I saw. So uh, I will encourage you to, if, if you're a person with, with burning skills, you know, uh, uh, the burning birds by sight and sound, uh, uh, get, get involved. Okay, well, hopefully this uh, episode was useful. Uh, if you like this channel, I'd appreciate it if you would uh, hit the subscribe button and subscribe to it. And also, uh, give me a like or dislike and, and send me comments about how things are going. Okay, until next time, get out and see some birds.